Good morning and welcome to worship. Please rise as you are able and join in the call to worship. Praise to the Lamb who is seated on the throne of heaven. Praise, Praise be to God, God who offers God's love to us. Let us sing continually of God's wisdom and power and might. Let our voices be raised in joyful celebration. Worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and majesty. Let our hearts rejoice at God's redeeming love for us. Amen. Before we take our seats, even though we're wearing our masks, I invite you to turn to someone and smile and wave at them. They can tell that, that that's the happy face behind the, that mask. This is our new passing of the peace, and I invite you to be seated. My name is Matt Hadley, and I am the uh, senior pastor here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, and it is great to have some live human beings here in the sanctuary. And it's always just great each and every week to have so many of you at home who continue to worship with us. And I know maybe those of us who are here in the room get sick of hearing it, but for so many of you who your church is not yet open and your church does not have the technology we have, I count it as a real honor that you have chosen to worship with us during this uh, pandemic uh, as we still are trying to come out to the other side of this. And so... Uh, thank you for your continuing support. And we've seen the numbers. The numbers are, are really good in terms of how many people are worshiping with us at home. On your way in, you should have received our contact card. And this card is important. We don't use it necessarily to track our membership. But each and every week as you are being ushered out of the sanctuary, we invite you to place your contact cards. And if you have used one of our pens to place it in the offering box along with any offering or coins from mission that you have, but this is to help us do any kind of contact tracing. If we get word that somebody at the 1030 service, and have no fear, everything was sterilized after those nine o'clock people left, uh, but we, that's a way that which we can get back to you. Also on this card is a telephone number, and that is what we're using to help keep connected with one another. Uh, you know, a lot of churches record early in the week, but we've made the decision to go live so that we can have live items of joy or concern that are being lifted up. So even if you're here in the sanctuary, please, if you want uh, Neil to read your text, or your uh, prayer, uh, please use this, this number there. Um, if you want to be a part of Habitat, 18 years or older, male or female, uh, we had one offering last Friday, but the next one's coming up is on the weekend, this Saturday. And you can contact Don Liebeck or Dick Steinmetz, and they'd be happy uh, to sign you up so that you can uh, get your hands dirty doing 
great good work. If you enjoyed Adam's horn during the prelude, uh, you got a big concert coming up this Wednesday, right? At uh, 7.30 as a part of this fantastic uh, concert series that we have been offering every Wednesday night. Uh, so many gifted people within this community of faith and some of uh, Neil's connections to bring others in. Um, and they are saved. So if you're busy this Wednesday night, you can still go on our website and, and hear uh, what Adam has for us. We're really trying to find ways to do church differently. There's a, a young couple within our community of faith that had a baptism for their just adorable little child scheduled early in the spring, and of course that couldn't happen. So finally we had that baptism yesterday here in the sanctuary. It was just the mom and the dad and uh, Tegan Simon Miller and Miss Monica, Monica Bissett represented the membership of the church, and that was a good connection because Tegan is enrolled downstairs in, in carpenter shop, and so there was just a handful of us here in the room, but there was a large crowd all across the country that were able to watch their niece, their granddaughter, uh, their friends, children, even the godparents, and the fun thing was they sent texts afterwards of images of uh, the people who were attending uh, standing in front of the TV with the baptism taking place. So uh, the, the ways in which we are staying connected. It won't be too long before Tegan and all people who are not yet a year are going to be hopefully running up here for children's time uh, very, very soon. And so one of the ways that we are continuing to be faithful to our children, not only through virtual Vacation Bible School, but is a continuing children's moment each and every week as we gather. And so let's receive this video offering of this week's children's message. Good morning. Today we are talking about connecting with God, even when times are hard. And I asked a couple of my friends how they connect with God. For me, it's being out in nature. Whenever I can get to nature, I feel God all around me. Hey, Miss Sue, how are you? I'm good. Hi, Miss Christy. I'm so glad to see you today. It is good to see you too. So in church today, we are talking about connecting with God and thinking about how do you carry on? How do you have God help you carry on even when things are tough? Well, it probably wouldn't surprise you that I love the music part of it. And there's a particular song that I like to listen to when I'm out on my walks, and it's called The Eye of the Storm, and it goes like this. Can I sing it for you? Would you please? Okay, it goes like this. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of a war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. That is so perfect. Thank you for sharing that with me. Sure. Some of the ways that I connect with God when times are hard is when I take walks, pet puppies, and spend time with my dad. I'm upset. I go to my bed and I pray to God. I have a song I want to teach the kids. It goes like this. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. I am not afraid, I am not dismayed, cause I'm walking in faith and victory. Come on and walk in faith and victory, for the Lord your God is with you. Ba -ba -ba. Thanks to uh, Christy and her uh, visitors and guests as uh, we continue to seek to be faithful to the children. Well, we have a, a great God who is always far more willing to hear than, than we are to pray. And so we have a litany for us uh, this morning to lead us into our time of prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. And so we turn to God in a time of silent and listening prayer. Let us open ourselves up.
We both seek and find you in creation, O oh God, in the world that you have made and the people you have called. Your vulnerable, powerful lamb is our shepherd and our guide, leading us to share the shelter of your abundant love and abundant life. Let us recognize you here in the beauty of this morning and in whatever challenges it may bring. May the risen one, your shepherd lamb, lead us to act for your justice and peace so that all may drink from your springs, from the waters of life, and find their tears of sorrow and tears of pain wiped away. And so God, we give you thanks that you do care, that you do draw near. And so now, mighty God, hear the prayers of your people this day. Prayers for nine-year-old Eloise, who broke her jaw in three places in a bike accident, and now also has a stomach infection that is keeping her in the hospital. Prayers for a daughter, Katie, who one way or another will deliver her baby this week. Prayers for the people in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, who suffered many losses during the inland hurricane that struck their city, especially for Carol Trelow, who's been without electricity for seven days and may continue to be without it for another four to seven more. Prayers for a father recovering from hip surgery. Prayers of comfort and healing for the Santilli family on what would have been Ron's 74th birthday. Prayers of comfort for three children of Nick Grosnick, who was killed in a bike accident yesterday. May they be surrounded by your love, God, and the love of their community during this tragic time. Prayers for all women going through hardships, that they get the support, love, and care, and prayers that they need. That people lean on God and ask him to help and trust that he is walking with them. Amen. Prayers that Kitty may find pain relief as her cancer has now spread to her spine. Prayers for an uncle battling brain cancer, and family members who are continuing to, to cope with the death of their father. These are the prayers of our people today. And so, mighty God, we give you thanks that you do hear, that you do love, that you do draw near. And so we have lifted up all of these prayers, whether sp spoken or text or, or lifted up without any sound whatsoever. We do it in the name of the risen one who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so we come now to a time in the service where we get to reflect upon the ways in which uh, we can give back to the God who gives so generously to us. And so as we are uh, contemplating this and thinking about the ways we give, uh, we'll allow this uh, musical number to guide us. And then when this number is done, uh, even though we haven't passed the plates, we are going to stand and we're going to sing our doxology.
so I invite the congregation to be seated as we prepare ourselves for God's word today that's going to come through scripture and proclamation. We're going to allow the hymn, We Shall Overcome, to prepare our hearts. Thank you, Andrea, for leading us in that. And we're going to hear a little bit later uh, in the message why that song was selected for us this morning. Well, last week I began a brand new sermon series called Sing Me the Truth. We want people to tell us the truth, but when we gather together at church and we sing our hymns, we are proclaiming what we believe to be true about our God. And so for five weeks, we're looking at uh, hymns from the greatest lyricist the Methodist movement has ever known, Charles Wesley, the little brother of a man named John. And John gets all the credit, but we know without Charles, this movement would have gotten nowhere because the music uh, stirred the soul and prepared the way for the message to break on in. Now, I have two passages to begin this message, and they're the kind of passages from the kind of book that sometimes make people nervous. They're from the Revelation. And the revelation makes us nervous because there's imagery of of beasts and there's all these numbers and we know that every number must have some kind of significance, but we get lost because we don't know how to break the code. And yet, really, this was a letter written to a group of Christ followers who are being persecuted so severely I mean, they wore scars of their persecution. They were uh, killed through this persecution. They were uh, put in jail because of this. And the whole message of the revelation is really hang in there. Yes, sometimes the imagery of 
the blood of lambs makes us nervous, but as we're going to hear, there is a point to all of that. This Paschal lamb, you see, it used to be that only once a year within God's people was the forgiveness of sins as a literal lamb was slain and the blood was placed on the altar. And, and Jesus, after death and resurrection, it was clear that he was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, the Paschal lamb of all Paschal lambs which is why that curtain, that veil that separated God from the people was torn in two when Christ was victorious, when he yelled out to tell us die, it is finished, paid in full. But let's encounter these texts. We're going to find that they're not so scary after all. And the first is from Revelation chapter 5. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders, they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And what were they doing? Singing with full voice. And this is what they were singing. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might forever and ever. Well, you just turn a couple pages if you have your, your Bibles, and you, you find yourself in the seventh chapter of the Revelation, and, and we hear these words. After this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And so last week we looked at... Uh, that the Methodist anthem, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Today we turn our attention to a great hymn called, Ye Servants of God, Ye Servants of God, Your Master Proclaim, and Publish Abroad His Wonderful Name, the name all victorious of Jesus extol. His kingdom is glorious and rules over all. God ruleth on high, almighty to save, and still he is nigh, his presence we have, the great congregation, his triumph shall sing, ascribing salvation to Jesus our King. Salvation to God who sits on the throne. Let all cry aloud and honor the Son. The praises of Jesus the angels proclaim. Fall down on their faces and worship the Lamb. Then let us adore and give him his right. All glory and power, all wisdom and might. All honor and blessing with angels above. And thanks never ceasing and infinite love. You can see how those stanzas were taken right from Charles's reading of the Revelation. Now, I am, when it comes to music, in the history of music, and the performance of music, uh, very much a layman. But we have such talented people within this community of faith and people who have actually studied hymnody. And so our very own Sue Stanley is going to stand with us each and every week during this sermon series and give us a little deeper insight, uh, the things that she learned in her seminary experience and in her lifetime of study. And this stuff really excites her. It does. <laughs> Ye Servants of God is, surprise, a doxology. And if you know what the word doxology means, it means like the appearance of God, appearance with the um, expression, a written expression or an oral expression. So expressing um, our glory of God, our, the God, the fact that God is present. It's actually a really good way to say thanks. And it's very often Trinitarian. Now, if that's a big churchy word for you, that means we celebrate God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, which we sang this morning just a few minutes ago when we sang our doxology at the end of the offering. So doxologies have evolved out of Judas, Jewish 
worship as kind of a, something to represent an ending to a section. So at the end of our offering, we traditionally have had the plates come forward and we stand to say, thank you, God, for everything that you've done, that celebration of God's glory. Sue, I think it would be appropriate, really, every day if we are people of gratitude to sing, to, to say the Lord's Prayer and to sing that doxology. Well, interesting you say the Lord's Prayer because this, there's a doxology, doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Where? Well, Jesus didn't say, for thine um, for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. It got added later by the church as a doxology. I knew that. I know, but they didn't. <laughs> so we went, or they might have, but uh, now they know, hopefully. So ye servants of God is a, uh, it's, it just starts out with a call to all people to shout out God's praise. And Charles did a really cool poetic thing in if you had the words in front of you, so you'll have to really pay attention when we sing it in a few minutes, that there's words at the end of one stanza that show up at the beginning of the next stanza. So at the end of the first stanza, he says, his kingdom is glorious and rules over all. The next stanza in our hymnal says, God ruleth on high. A little emphasis there. At the end of that second stanza, he says, ascribing salvation to Jesus our king. And guess what's the first word in the third stanza? Salvation to God. And then at the end of that third stanza, he says, worship the lamb. At the beginning of our last stanza, he says, then let us adore. Adore and worship mean the same thing, but because of poetry, they don't, you can't put both of them in the same place. So we always pay attention to meter. So when we sing this in a minute, we're going to be saying, be saying thanks to God. All right, thank you very much, Sue. And so each week, we're taking a look at the scripture that inspired these texts. We're looking at the history. We're going to tell a little story so that we can get to a point where we are able to take a lesson with us out of this sanctuary and out into the world in which we live. And so I chose those passages from the Revelation first because in our hymnal it, it says right there at the bottom, words by Charles Wesley, and it, it cites that scriptural text. But secondly and most importantly, I read both of those texts because of the persecution that was going on because of how difficult it was at that time to be a person of faith and how, how many people were abandoning their faith because it just got too tough for them. These texts are a cry for God's people to stand strong in the faith and to remember that come what may, good will ultimately triumph over evil. Jesus is worthy to be proclaimed and praised come what may even in times of persecution. And actually this song was written in response to the persecution that the Methodist movement was experiencing. A persecution that they knew all too well, especially in a state-run church. And so when this hymn was first published, it was published in a collection of hymns called Hymns for Times of Trouble and Persecution. And within that book, there was this really great little section called Hymns to be Sung in a Tumult. And so you wonder, well, how are the Wesley movement being uh, persecuted? Well, all kinds of lies started to come out about them. They were dubbed papists, and that means that they were loyal to the Pope, to the, the Roman church uh, with the Pope, as opposed to the King of England's church. They were also uh, uh, charged of being anti-throne. Lies of Charles were being spread and circulated that he was a villain, he was a pickpocket, he was a rogue. And there was even a rumor that was spreading that he was simply a representative of a pretender to the throne whose name was John and who disguised himself as a priest. And so this persecution was there. It was actually persecution that was ordered. There was this famous uh, experience that happened in a little place called Wasall, and this letter preceded it. It was a letter to the high constables, a letter to the petty constables, and it was a letter to all the majesty's peace officers. And it said, basically, warning, we've got information that there are some disorderly persons styling themselves as Methodist preachers. Boy, you've got to watch out for people who style themselves as a Methodist preacher. And it says, so they're, they're going about raising routes and riots and great damage to his majesty's liege of people against the peace of the sovereign king. And so the people in these villages were commanded to make a diligent search for these Methodist preachers 
and to bring him or them uh, before some of us majesties, justice of the peace, to be examined for their unlawful doings. That was posted in this little place called Wasall, and then the Wesleys showed up, and they held their revival And John was preaching at the foot of the cross when the crowd came, grabbed him by the hair, and dragged him by the hair down the main street. I don't know if it was dirt. I don't know if it was cobblestone. I know it could not have felt good. Dragged him by his hair all the way before the court to give a defense of himself. Charles Wesley once wrote that when he goes into a new town, it was easy to pick out which homes were the Methodist homes because they wore the marks of violence on them, probably more than just egging or TPing a house, marks of violence. You see, when the Methodists started to hold their services, there were groups that would release the bulls from the pen and drive the bulls through the crowd in order to disperse them. There were drummers that were hired to make so much noise that the preacher couldn't be heard to drown out the singing in a different uh, 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 rhythm than what they were doing, anything they could to disrupt. They did stuff that's even kind of stereotypical. They threw rotten fruit and tomatoes and rocks and sticks, usually from behind. The Wesleys were injured, wounded, time and time again. But something miraculous happened. Some of those in the angry crowd noticed that the Wesleys could not be shook. There was nothing that would shake them up. Some people wondered what was the source of their strength which gave John and Charles and others an open door to proclaim just what kind of serenity and peace and really a different kind of power the Holy Spirit gives them no matter what is going on. And and John famously said of himself and encouraged all other Methodists to always look a mob in the face. Always look a mob in the face. Now, we've heard the four stanzas, and we're going to sing the four stanzas that have been in our hymnal for for so long, but there were actually two others. Two others. You see, those four stanzas don't really give us a glimpse to the persecution and to the trial that was going on, and so I'm going to invite Neil to come on up, or is David going to do it? David's right behind me. Don't throw rocks or rotten tomatoes or things at me, and so Sue and I are going to sing these two stanzas that were omitted, and they really sing to that in the face of of pure hatred and evil coming against us in the face of lies and rumors, there's a source of strength that can see us through. And so, go ahead, David. The waves of the sea have lift up their voice, sore troubled that we in Jesus rejoice. The floods they are roaring, but Jesus is here. While we are adoring, he always is near. When devils engage, the billows arise and horribly rage and threaten the skies. Their fury shall never our steadfastness shock. The weakest believer is built on a rock the weakest believer, even that one with just the the least amount of faith, still stands on the rock, has a source of power. We know that Charles read his Bible each and every day, several times a day, and he surely, surely would have clung to 1 Peter chapter 5, where we read in verse 10 these words. It's a promise to God's people who are undergoing persecution. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. That is very good news. 
And so everything that we've done up to this point in the lesson gets us ready for our lesson today. A singular lesson. We find in this hymn, ye servants of God, a Christian pledge of allegiance to God for the faithful who serve one who is greater than all the kings, all the queens, all the dictators, all the elected officials that will ever be. Worldly leaders come and go, but God is steadfast. So carry on with your faith. Make sure your allegiance is in the right place. Now, is anyone else already, just here in August, sick of the uh, political campaigns, the, the uh, it's hard to turn the TV on, right, with all these ads that we're being flooded with. And in years, in a democracy like ours, both sides of the aisle claim God's favor. But what happens if we are not careful is our focus on the candidate might start to take a greater place in our life than the one who gave life, the one who redeemed life, the one who sustains life. God rules above all. There are no pretenders with any claims to the throne upon which the author of salvation sits. Which means that it doesn't matter what's happening in our world. It doesn't matter what's happening in our neighborhood. There is a power that can be at work, that needs to be at work, that should be at work through God's people, strengthened and sustained by this amazing, amazing love. As I said four years ago, we had a sermon series uh, called God and Politics, and the Sunday before Election Tuesday, the sermon was, is God, or is Jesus a Democrat or Republican? Some of you were here, some of you remember that. And the answer to that question was that Jesus, the, the, the truth and the love of Jesus Christ can be found in the best of both, but is nowhere in the worst of either. You see, the Wesleys were charged with being anti-throne, but that, that's not true. They knew they had a call by God to stay faithful to, to who was there. That doesn't mean you can't work for change, but they had to be faithful. First Peter also says this in chapter 2, For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme or of governors, as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live free. As free people, do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. Fear God and honor the emperor. Another translation says, revere God, respect the government. Yes, they were always faithful to the throne, but their ultimate allegiance was always to God. Even Jesus was challenged about where should allegiance be, and so the, these church leaders, they're trying to trick him. They're trying to, to give him enough rope just to kind of hang himself, and so tell us then, they asked, what you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. Powerful words. We live in an age filled right now with mobs and rioting. And as followers of Jesus, we are called upon anew to stand firm in our faith as a champion, as champions of an infinite love. Amid political, economic, and social injustices, Christians all around the world, right here at home and all around the world, looking very much like us and looking very different from us, sounding very much like us and sounding very different from us, Christians around the world are beckoned to turn cries of agony and hatred into resounding praises of God. The love of God in Jesus Christ is so transforming has such power that it can change discriminatory laws. It can rectify exploitation of the poor. It can provide shelter for the homeless and food for the hungry. And as your pastor, I just sit back and marvel 
I see all that stuff happening through our mission and ministry, all those things, working for justice, working to provide shelter, to provide food. That's the good work we do here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, seeking to balance charity and justice work. But friends, injustices, all injustices, fall before the power of God. You know, I think maybe we take this for granted more than we should, but we live in a place, a great, great place that was built in part upon the freedom of religion with the right to free speech. Most all of us here would say that we are blessed to live in a land without fear of religious persecution. But this is not true across the board. No, there are many of God's people that, that need to cling to ye servants of God. Now, there is persecution when freedom of religion clashes with freedom from religion in sometimes violent ways. Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, our Jewish brothers and sisters have too often been the victims of hateful actions. And to this day, in many expressions of religion, women and the LGBTQ community, our family and our friends, continue to be persecuted. Charles Wesley scholar S.T. Kimbrough writes, "Ye servants of God is an 18th century cry of the soul against oppression and persecution, not unlike the 20th century outcry against injustice that we see in the song, We Shall Overcome. It is through faith that we have the power to overcome. Charles Wesley illustrated this point not only with his pen, but with his, with his very life. And so it's no longer the 18th century, it's no longer the 20th century. It is the 21st century. And we know that in the 21st century and beyond, this song is a call for all of God's people, people of faith, to keep doing what is right, even in, especially in the midst of persecution, no matter what form that persecution presents itself. And so yes, brothers and sisters here, in this sanctuary, at home, in a car with a smartphone, ye servants of God, your master, proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name all victorious of Jesus extol. His kingdom is glorious and rules over all and forever will. Amen. And so let's stand up and sing this song that we've been hearing so much about, ye servants of God.
brothers and sisters, take this message out into the world with you. May God shine God's love and blessing all over you this week. Remember, you have been created with a very, very special calling to be the hands and feet of God here on earth. In just a moment, our usher is going to help uh, escort you out. We invite you to place your contact cards and your pens and any offerings or coins for mission uh, in our box. Um, we're going to have our hands sanitized when we go out. I'll be out there to greet you outside. Go in peace.